Practice the top of the morning to you. Then, of course, they tell me, no, it's no island the country, Bob. It's island, you know, water all the way around it. Felt like a bit of a deal, but I thought, righty, let's go and get adventuring. Whoa, smooth. Who put that there? Silly place to put a stick. And if you find yourself trekking around through the shrub, you've got to always be on the lookout. Oh, not usually for branches. Snakes or lizards and branches too. Crikey. The really bonzer thing about being on a sand island is that if you get lost, not that I'm lost, but if you do get lost, a great way to find your own way back is just to follow your footprints. So in this case, I'd, oh gee, a lot of footprints around here, aren't there? And uh, I reckon, uh, I reckon that's a set to follow though. Right this way. Oh, I'm just taking thoughts. I reckon that's our prince. Car must be that way. Beauty. we head off to some islands in search of science. We go tracking some seals on Phillip Island, find out all about quokkas on Rottnest Island, and I go exploring around Morton Island. Hello there and welcome to Scope. As you probably gathered from that opening sequence, or just by taking a look at my surrounds, today is all about island science. Now, although you can't exactly see all the way around it from here, I'm actually on an island as well. It's Morton Island. It's about one hour by boat from Brisbane. Morton Island is mostly made up of national and marine park. And despite the abundance of greenery, Morton is actually a sand island, meaning it's almost entirely composed of sand. And a good portion of that sand is in Mount Tempest. At over 280 metres tall, it's the highest stabilised sand hill in the world. Indeed, this is the third largest sand island in the entire world. And I, for one, find it pretty remarkable that life can not just exist, but even flourish on what is essentially just a big outcrop of sand. <laughs> of course, it didn't just spring up overnight, but you can find a load of different landscapes here, including the rather strange perched lakes. Everywhere you look on an island like this one, you find different environments, and some form of life has managed to carve out a niche. Now, I mentioned that this is the third largest sand island. Well, the largest is actually Fraser Island, and it's north from here, by a fair way. And the second largest, well, that's just south of here. Let's go there now. Islands aren't just fun places to visit. They're also great places to do scientific research. Hi, I'm Dr Robbie Wilson from the University of Queensland. And today, we're going to check out some of the ecosystems you find on an island. The ecology of an area is characterised by the way different species interact with their environment. This means monitoring things like population, diversity and competition of organisms living in a certain place. Because islands are usually small areas of land surrounded by water, they often have unique and interesting ecologies. Island life can also mean there are often fewer predators and vastly different habitats and conditions. And over long periods of time, this can also impact species as they adapt to their new and different conditions. Over time, some animals evolve to become bigger or smaller than their mainland relatives due to the availability of resources on the island. Some creatures also adapt to different environmental conditions that others may not have been able to live in. For example, surviving in warmer or cooler conditions than they usually would. The island we're on today is North Stradbroke Island. 
and there's a huge diversity of ecosystems on this island, from beaches to rainforests to wetlands to creeks. And the great thing about this island is there's not many people. And with not many people, there's not many pets like cats and dogs. There's not much pollution. The native animals do very well in this location. So let's go and see what we can find today. So we're only about a kilometre from the coastline, but here we find ourselves a beautiful freshwater creek. And just a couple of scoops, I've managed to find these little guys, ornate rainbow fish. Now these are special to the islands around here because they're adapted for the low pH conditions, which means they live in really acidic conditions. Let's see what else we can find. So I've also managed to find a few of these guys. These are slender crayfish. And again, like the rainbow fish, they are unique to the low pH conditions of these creeks. Like all crayfish though, they are high in numbers and they love to fight with each other. So I might put this little fella down before he decides to give me a little bite. And one of the really interesting animals we find on this island is the koala. And while they may not be doing too well on the mainland, and they're not very common on islands around Australia, here, they're doing extremely well. And that's probably because there's not many developments going forward, there's not many dogs, and there's not many cars. So they're really thriving. The kind of thing we find around here in this kind of... Oh, sorry, fellas, you're making a little film here. I'm doing a little Aussie Bob, Aussie Bob's Island Adventures. G'day, how are Dr. you? Dr. Robbie. Yep, yep. Um, so this is embarrassing. Sorry, we'll, look, we'll move on. You know where the main road is? Might have lost the car. That way, mate. That Super. Way. Super. This way, fellas. So next time you're on an island, take a look around you. You never know what amazing things you might find. Well, today is all about island science, but right now we're not on the island anymore. We're just off the island, and I'm guessing it's got something to do with the wrecks behind me and all of this snorkeling gear. So tell me, Sheridan, why are there a bunch of wrecks here? Well, the wrecks behind us are actually the Tangaluma wrecks. They were sunk here on purpose um, to create an artificial reef. Ah, very nice. And how long have they been here? They've been here between 30 and 50 years ago. They were actually sunk here on purpose. Um, basically, when bad weather comes through, it comes in from this direction, which means um, that the water gets really, really rough. So boats would basically moor on the other side of the wreck just to offer a safe, nice um, passage for them. Pretty a nice little shelter zone in there. And I guess it creates a really nice ecosystem for a lot of marine life down there as well. But it definitely does. Because it's been there for so long, it's actually created an artificial reef. So um, there's plenty of hard and soft corals growing all over them. And I know people usually think that's really boring, but that actually tra attracts over 200 different species of tropical fish. We also get um, sharks. Ooh, um, cool. we, we also get rays and turtles as well. Excellent. Well, I can't wait to get down there and have a look, but we Ooh. are going to have wait just a tiny bit longer. So stick around. Hello there and welcome back to Scope. Today it's all about island science and that's an island behind me, Morton Island. We'll be exploring that shortly, but right now I want to explore the waters just around Morton Island. There's some wrecks over there with coral and fish and stuff. Let's go take a look. So Sharon, can you tell me about some of the fish that we saw out there? Um, yeah, definitely, definitely. Um, with the coral that we got down there, the hard and soft corals, that attracts all those tropical fish. So, Morris Idol, um, Butterbrim, plenty of those beautiful guys down there. 
We also did see that lovely Wobby Gong. He's full of character with his cute little beard. So Wobby Gong in Aboriginal actually means shaggy beard. And as you can see, he has got a cute little one as well. Very nice. Tell me, how does the coral get here? Because I guess there wasn't traditionally coral around this area. It's just a sand island. How does it arrive here? Well, yes, you're correct. So um, coral can't actually attach to a sandy substrate. It needs something hard to attach to. So these wrecks were absolutely perfect for it. There's actually a reef up um, a little bit further north called Flinders Reef. Um, they would have spawned up there and basically slowly made their way down. Stripped it down and now they're here and thriving. Excellent. Yeah. Oh, do you ever see seals here? <laughs> Funny you say that. Not usually, but we did actually have one last week. Ah, very cool. Well, for more seals, uh, look no further than here. we get seal trackers coming out right now. Victoria's Phillip Island might be famous for its nightly parades of little penguins waddling across the beach, but they aren't the only species making waves around here. Hi, I'm Rebecca, and I'm one of a team of scientists working on a large fur seal colony that live on another island just out there. It's known as Seal Rocks, and it's home to approximately 30,000 seals. It is, in fact, the largest breeding colony of Australian fur seals in the country with about 6,000 pups being born here every year. Part of the research we're doing involves studying their foraging behaviour. And to do that, we use these devices, a satellite tracker and a time depth recorder. We put these tracking devices on the seals' backs so we can find out exactly what the seals get up to when they're out at sea. The trackers record information like the depth of the seal's dives and the temperature of the water around it, how fast the seal moves, which tells us when a seal is chasing prey, and when the seal has come back home to seal rocks. You can see here on the screen, this is one of the seals we've been tracking. We get its locations using the satellite tracker and we map them. And then we use a time depth recorder to work out how deep they're diving, which you can see underneath the track as it goes around. And then on this screen, you can see all the locations mapped of all the seals we've tracked. And the blue is seal rocks. Our analysis of data like this has already revealed that the seals usually feed at depth, usually diving straight to the sea floor to look for food. We think they might also be influenced by changes with temperature within the water column. The satellite tracking is only part of the work that we're doing. We're also studying the seals' diet, and the best way to do that is to take a close look at these. These are seal scats that I collected from seal rocks yesterday. After soaking them in water overnight, I then put this solution through a special sieve so that just the hard materials in the scats remain. By hard materials, I mean tiny bones and beaks, like this one, which we use to work out what the seals are eating. In particular, we are looking for bones called otoliths. These are tiny bones that are found in the ears of fish, and every species is different. So when we find an otolith in a seal scat, we know what fish the seal has been feeding on. We use a microscope and these identification guides to work out the otoliths from the scats. For example, this one here is a jack mackerel. We use the information we gather from the seal scats collected to monitor how the seal's diet changes over time and whether the effects of oceanographic and climate variations are affecting the type of prey in the ocean. We hope that all the research work that we're doing will help to conserve not only the Australian fur seals living out there on seal rock, but will improve our understanding of all marine life in Bass Strait and will help to protect it in the future. indeed, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, it's that time of the show again. It's time for DIY science. DIY science. DIY science. DIY science. DIY science. DIY science. When you're trying to find your way around, the most basic thing to know is which way is which? These days, most people use a smartphone compass to figure out which way is north and which is south. These work by using something called a digital magnometer, which measures changes in the Earth's magnetic field, along with an accelerometer, which measures how the phone moves. But what if you were on a remote island? Well, today, whether it's north, south, east or west, we will be able to find our way around with a homemade compass. You'll need a shallow bowl, water, a needle, scissors, a magnet with north and south markings, and a piece of wax paper. 
first we need to turn this plain old needle into a magnet. Use one end of your magnet and run it all the way along the length of the needle. Do this over and over again, at least 50 times. Make sure you always move the magnet along the needle in the same direction. So now your needle should have a north pole and a south pole. Next, cut a small circle of wax paper and thread the needle through it so it pokes out on both ends. Grab your water and your dish. This is going to form the base of your compass. Pour about a centimetre of water into the dish and wait until the water stops moving. Then, carefully place your needle on top of the water and watch what happens. The needle spins around to point north and south. Even when you gently move the dish or spin the needle, it spins right back. You can check that your compass is working by comparing it to a smartphone compass. But my needle compass works a little differently. It lines up with the Earth's magnetic fields. You see, there are tiny regions in my needle called magnetic domains, just like there are in all magnetically attracted metals. The electrons in these magnetic domains are usually all jumbled up. But when I rubbed the needle with the magnet, it lined up the domains so that they are arranged neatly from north to south. Well, my compass might not be practical enough to use for any real navigation, but I think that a compass you can make yourself sure can get you heading in the right direction. Coming up on Scope, we find out all about the rather curiously named quokkas, and we go looking around here for a giant sand dune to try and slide down. So stick around. Hello there, you are back on Scope, and I'm on Morton Island for this Island Science episode. Although up next I want to transport you to a whole different island, Rottnest Island, just off the coast of Western Australia. At just 11 kilometres at its longest and four and a half kilometres across at its widest, the total area of the island is just 19 square kilometres. Rottnest Island got its name from these incredibly cute and curious members of the marsupial family that live there. A Dutch explorer named the island Rottnest, which translates as rat's nest. But of course it wasn't rats that he saw, but rather quokkas. And here's resident expert Helen Jones with loads more interesting quokka facts. So a quokka is a marsupial, or a member of the macropod family. That means that they're related to kangaroos and wallabies, and they're really similar, except they're much, much smaller than kangaroos and wallabies. There are approximately 8 to 12,000 quokkas on Rottnest Island, which is in direct comparison to how many there are in the southwest of Western Australia, where there are only a couple of hundred scattered throughout. Quokkas are nocturnal animals and they feed all night long and what they like to feed on most is fresh green grass and leaves and other bits and pieces of plants. And so what's fascinating about the quokka is that it's evolved over time to be able to adapt to the low rainfall that we have. The way that it copes with this is that it actually sources its moisture from the leaves and grass that it eats at night time. Quokka joeys stay with their mums until they're 9 to 12 months old. When they reach that age, if they're females, generally they'll stay around their mum and the same area that they were born in. If they're males, however, they disperse throughout the island to go and find different areas and to have their own territories. The males are territorial on Rottnest, so you will find sometimes the males that you see can have a couple of scars or there's some fur missing, and that happens in the natural course of them fighting for the females. So we don't have any feral animals here which are a threat to quokkas the way that foxes and cats are on the mainland. As a result of this, the quokkas on Rottnest are incredibly curious and will come right up to you. When they do this, it's really easy to forget that they're actually a wild animal. 
If you're thinking about planning your very own island adventure, then I highly recommend it. There's three basic things you've got to remember for your own survival. You're going to need shelter, you're going to need food, and you're going to need access to clean drinking water. Here's your tropical juice, Mr Bobson. Oh, thanks very much, Stacey. <laughs> Of course, you could live in a cave and drink out of a stream, but maybe tomorrow. At least Stacey wouldn't mind an umbrella. It's getting a little bit hot out here. Oh. As you know, today on Scope, we've come to an island. Morton Island, to be exact. But this sand island actually comes with its very own desert. And Chris here is going to take us on a bit of a tour. So Chris, tell me, how is it thought that this area of the island came to be a desert? So it's a bit of a mystery, but we think that uh, some natural disaster happened in the past, which wiped out the vegetation, the plants in this area, and then they haven't been able to re-establish because the conditions are quite harsh here, so very little water, and uh, we get strong winds as well. As you look around, the desert sands seem very uniform in colour, but in fact, that's not the case at least when you scratch the surface. So this is what we call the Tiwa coloured sands. And so these sands here uh, are made up of different types of minerals. Oh wow, look at that. Yeah, so you I can already see we've got... Like some black and, and deep sort of orangey colour there. What would that be from? A few different types there. So we've got this orangey colour, so these are iron rich sands. Uh, then we've got the white colour as well, so a bit of titanium oxide and then the dark colour, so these are the zircon. Ah, oh, the black there, yeah. So this particular part of the desert we call Lightning Ridge, uh, and this is a part where it's experienced quite a lot of lightning strikes. None today, hopefully, clear sky, so that's good. What do you think attracts the lightning to this particular spot as opposed to anywhere else in the desert? You see it's a little bit raised up here and uh, it probably has a certain charge as well uh, associated with this area. A lot which of mineral is the... sands under here, so I guess yeah. that makes sense, doesn't That's it? Right. Yeah. Um, and where do these come from, these things, little rocks? Ah, so these are called fulgurites. Ah, these are fulgurites. And these are formed when the lightning hits the sand, heats it up to about 2,000 degrees and fuses those particles together. Wow, so it literally, it, it literally melts the sand? Yeah, that's right. Wow, that's cool. So it's a little bit like, I suppose, when, when they make glass and they melt sand as part of that process. That's exactly right. So glass is made from the same minerals, silica. And these both look and sound a little bit glassy when you whack them together. And they're scattered all over, almost like they've exploded out of it. Chris has one more place he wants to show me, the famous Tangaluma sand dunes. They're about 60 to 70 metres high and I'm told they're great to slide down. The only problem, of course, is getting up. Chris, I might just uh, pull us up here for a moment, even though we're not even halfway and we've got most of the hill to go. Uh, tell me, what's the technique with sandboarding? Obviously, uh, smooth side down to the sand and shoot to the bottom, but there must be a little bit more to it than that. Yeah, so we just need to lie down flat on the board, yep. position our head around about here, yep. hold on to the top, elbows up, and pulling upward. Uh, to give it a nice, a nice smooth surface to uh, shoot down the sand and not get too much in the face. I should be reaching speeds of up to 50 kilometres per hour. So this should be fun. All right, and we're set. All right, oh, and we're off. Ah, ha, ha. Well, this is great fun. Oh, we're down. That was good. I think time for another go. That was pretty fun, even though I've now got a mouthful of sand. Unfortunately, though, it is all the time we have today. But let's not forget all the fun we've had. We took a tour of the many different habitats and the creatures that live in them on the sand island that is North Stradbroke. We tracked some seals around Phillip Island and looked for fish ear bones in their poo. And we found out how to make your own magnetic compass. And you know what? If you did miss any of that, it doesn't matter, because you can find it all on our website. But make sure you set your clocks for island time. The next time, when the ordinary becomes extraordinary. Under the scope. <laughs>